Hello, I'm Larry Diamond. I'm director of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law here at Stanford University. Uh, many people ask, we have a program here at Stanford on liberation technology, and they ask, liberation technology, what is that? Well, um, this has to do with information and communication technology that is in some way liberating of the human spirit and the human potential. Uh, and it has two big dimensions. One is political and the other is economic. Uh, many forms of information and communication technology are empowering people to become more effective agents of their own economic improvement and well-being uh, and their own health and education as well. There are a lot of exciting uh, tools and social media networks that are being developed that enable uh, farmers to understand and know better uh, what kinds of inputs they need um, for uh, effectively producing and protecting their crops, uh, enable them to better anticipate weather conditions, and enable them to know better the market conditions so they can sometimes bypass uh, exploitative uh, middlemen in the um, marketing process and market their crops more directly uh, and get a fairer price for them. The same goes in the fishing industry, the handicraft industry, and other small-scale industries. Mobile technology is being used uh, to enable people who live far away from a clinic to get access to doctors and nurses and perhaps simple diagnoses of common illnesses or advice on uh, different ailments from professionals. Uh, and there are a wide variety of means as well that these kinds of information and communication technologies and platforms, particularly mobile platforms, are being used for disaster relief, to coordinate disaster relief, to uh, track and crowdsource um, uh, where the most serious problems are in natural disasters or in human disasters, including uh, political crises and um, uh, violent conflicts. They enable us uh, to uh, better monitor the functioning of government and of elections by deploying large numbers of human rights monitors or poll watchers who have mobile phones that can be used to take photographs, to uh, send back test, text messages with the results of an election from a local station that can then be aggregated across the country, or to report on police abuse or other human rights problems in an area. And um, uh, all of these are ways in which the mobile phone often in interaction with um, uh, internet technology, can be used to enable people to take development more effectively into their own hands, to take their health, their education, their human improvement, their safety, and the organization of better, more, um, more connected communities into their own hands to foster broad-based development with transparency, good governance, uh, and uh, more distributed resourcefulness and uh, political and economic capacity. Uh, it is often said that knowledge is power, and there's probably been no invention uh, in human history that has more rapidly transformed the capacity of people to acquire knowledge rapidly, and particularly of relatively poor people, to get access to vast troves of knowledge and even um, real-time information that can uh, empower them than the mobile phone. Uh, so we're very excited about the ways that these technologies can serve the cause of just sustainable uh, human development. In India, we see the power of civil society to mobilize against corruption using very innovatively social media 
uh, to crowdsource reporting uh, against corruption, reporting of corruption, uh, and use it to pressure and even embarrass public officials to do better. And here I would note and strongly uh, commend and celebrate the work of the Indian civil society organization Janagraha, which developed a very innovative website called I Paid a Bribe, where citizens can go when a bribe is demanded of them by a public official in India and report that a bribe was demanded, even report if they felt compelled to pay the bribe. And then when you get large numbers of these reports, the uh, information technology of crowdsourcing can note where the hot, where the hot spots, where the high incidences of bribe demanding are coming from in a government bureaucracy and put intense pressure on them uh, to get serious about reining in this corruption and giving uh, citizens the services they're entitled to without demanding a bribe in advance for performance of the service. And of course, in the world we live in, uh, this kind of technology diffuses very rapidly. So now the I Pay to Bribe platform has diffused to a number of other developing countries in the post-communist world, in countries like uh, Kenya and Africa. Uh, and I think it shows the great promise of an energized, resourceful, uh, technologically uh, learning civil society uh, to uh, work with the public sector and not just always in opposition to it to uh, improve the functioning of government and thereby uh, deliver more effective, just, and sustained development. So we are seeing a number of uh, very inspiring and illuminating efforts um, by civil society actors um, to improve their own democracies. <clears throat> and there's much that we can learn from. I spoke about the work of the Indian civil society organization, uh, Janagraha, uh, to crowdsource uh, against corruption. More generally, um, social media tools, including um, the mass messaging platform Frontline SMS have made a big difference in uh, facilitating and enlarging election monitoring, uh, where civil society networks come together in a very systematic way to monitor elections uh, and produce what's called a parallel vote tabulation, where they place enough monitors around the country in at least a random sample of the polling stations and watch the voting and report the results to a central uh, counting station that's independent. Uh, and if this is done systematically and technologically reasonably well, uh, it can generate a um, uh, autonomous, independent check on the vote count, its own uh, separate uh, parallel vote tabulation that can be a, a big deterrence uh, against fraud and a tool to reverse electoral fraud if it happens. I'm a very strong believer in the value and necessity of free, fair, competitive democratic elections.